on. It's controversial. Having that guy around is the, the best thing that ever happened to the squad. If you have the right mix of autism and steroids, all these pundits and whatnot, a lot of people doubting me, you know. I don't want to fucking have a conversation while I'm showering, you know, like, the hobby I do is already so gay. You are now listening to the El Segundo podcast with Craig Jones. Guys, El Segundo podcast is back. This time, no guest, no co-host. I've been traveling too damn much, and I haven't been able to organize fucking anything. The only thing I organized was the Lady Boy podcast, but that came naturally. I didn't have to find her; she found me. Um, but yeah, I've been traveling too much. We've been going Indonesia, Thailand, Philippines, back to Indonesia. I've basically been on the travel path of a recently single or widowed 65 year old Australian man looking for love, looking for potentially 18 year old or under, if they're that way inclined love, maybe the Philippines, you know what I mean? That's the adventure I've been on, but I've been on that adventure for business. I've been doing business out there. I've been working very, very hard as my Instagram shows, but I had to do this podcast because fucking so much has been going on I'm doing this podcast live from yeah like I said a Wollongong park bench which is basically a five-star hotel in this neck of the woods when you think of Wollongong for those of you who don't know I want you to think of the culture I want you to think of the beauty the art the average level of education of Sydney I want you to think of all those things in Sydney and I want you to remove all those things and what you're left with is Wollongong now, Wollongong has some things on offer. Its major source of employment would be something in Australia we call Centrelink, which I believe in America would be called unemployment or government benefits. Now, that's the chief recruiter down here. That's the biggest industry. That's the industry most people work for down here. If you're below 25 and you're not on Centrelink down here and you have a uh, stable 9 to 5 job, you're fucking flying above the average here. You know what I mean? That's that's what this place is, but I love it. I love coming down here. Not as much as I love leaving, but I love coming down here. But I'm here now to help Volkanovski prepare for Ilya Taporia. Obviously not a grappling heavy match, but we show our face anyway. Taporia does have some submissions. This is a match I don't think is going to be decided by a submission in the pure sense of the word. Someone might get submitted, but usually probably as a result of their will being broken or them being rocked and caught in a submission. I don't think it's going to be like... Like, obviously, Islam knocked Volks out. But that fight could have been decided by a Islam takedown and submission. That was much more realistic threat. Do I think Ilya is going to come out and hit a Khabib-style game plan? No, I don't think anyone does. But I'm here. We're here to support. And we're here to cover all bases. But yeah, it's going to be a sick, sick fucking fight. Volks back in fine form. Strong as ever. I think when he gets his hands on Ilya, Ilya won't have experienced that level of strength from a person of Volk's size. I think that's going to be the most shocking thing. Most, I mean, even for me, I go away, I come back, and I think, fuck, this cunt is strong. That fucking rugby strength. And I think even if you watch the uh, Islam fights, you see Islam really notice how strong Volk's is. It catches people by surprise because he's a little guy. He looks like a little guy. Islam made many jokes about him being little. And then obviously when he got out there and he felt the strength, it's, uh, that compounds the shock because not only did you not expect him to be that strong, but he's little and that strong. So I think that's going to be shocking for Ilya and just about any 145er, really. But I won't say too much about uh, obviously the game plan or anything like that, but definitely tune in to this event. It's going to be sick. Obviously Whitaker versus Pulo Costa is the co-main. Everyone loves Whitaker. Everyone loves Costa's Twitter. Let's just hope Costa shows up to this one. I don't know what happened with the last one. I was super hyped for that. Costa doesn't fight very often. He's fucking busy writing jokes, something I really stand behind as a movement. Obviously, I mean, jokes come before fights or matches. That's what's most important. Social media currency. Forget about those titles. Pulo Costa has that in the bag. His gay jokes on Twitter, fucking incredible. His shout out to my Keep Jiu Jitsu Gay shirt. That doesn't go unnoticed, my friend. 
But yeah, apart from that, I mean, when I got there, I hit a Wollongong. <laughs> Izzy was here, Izzy was doing some work and some training in. Obviously, come back from injury. Nothing announced for him. Uh, but he's staying ready. He's getting ready. Fucking always good to see the legend, especially him coming down here to Wollongong. I don't know if he's been down here before, but yeah, he was here and Jack Dell is here for the week to train too. Uh, so obviously seeing Izzy, Volks, and Jack down in the same room, fucking wild, a wild sight to see. Jack, I'm doing a bit of help with him, helping him a little bit. As much as I can for the Gilbert Burns fight, which is in March in Miami, he has that fight books. That's a three rounder. I wish that was a five rounder, but this one's gonna be fucking sick. I haven't personally trained with Gilbert, but I've been in the room with him. He used to visit New York and train with the boys. I don't know why I didn't train with him, but I did compete against him. But what I will say is that competition match we had kind of, I won't say it's bullshit, but kind of we didn't learn anything. You know, it was a five minute submission underground match, and I sat down. And he tried to flying arm by me from guard and that gave me access to his legs and I heel hooked him and then given the small amount of pay he gets for grappling and the large amount of pay he gets for MMA fights, he obviously tapped very quickly and lived to fight another day, you know? So I don't glean too much from that. It's actually sad. I wish we'd had a longer, a longer match there so I could really feel it out. And again, I haven't trained with him, but I've been studying his game. Obviously, I'm a personal fan of Gilbert Burns big fan of Jack Della too. I think Jack Della, man, this guy is so good. What was he? I think he was four or five first round finishes. His last fight was a decision and a lot of people thought it was a close fight. So he lost a bit of hype with that, but I can't express to you how good this guy is. And as good as a striker as he is, I think he's arguably an even better grappler. And when I say grappling, I don't mean jujitsu in the pure sense. I mean, his ability to create reversals and get up from positions. A lot of people don't uh, see that when they see uh, Jack Della fight. So Jack is down here for another week. He has been working with me. Unfortunately, I got staff early, so I haven't been out of train with him too much, but Jack has been doing very, very good. It's been great watching him and Volk's work, him and Izzy work. I think when I first uh, paid attention to Jack Della was his contender series fight. So he had a contender series fight, I forget his opponent, his opponent ended up making the UFC as well, but it was a sick, sick fight, obviously Jack, the, comment, the commentators noticed him because of the boxing, but there was one particular reversal he hit in the first round where uh, his opponent hit a rear body lock, dropped Jack to his knees, and Jack hit this mucky corny, like fat man roll through, fucking a thing of beauty, if you go back and watch the scramble, absolutely incredible. And he's a guy I've always watched since then, paid close attention to. I got to go train with him in Perth. And then, yeah, he's here now. And even just watching him train now, he's so creative on the scrambles. And that's what, that's something that really impresses me is when I watch someone. And not only are they effective, obviously you have to be effective. If you're creative and not effective, you're probably too fucking high, you're an idiot. But if you're able to find creative, unorthodox ways to be effective in grappling exchanges, especially considering so many people train grappling, so many smart people are working on it. And when people find unorthodox solutions that work at the highest level, that is the innovation we love to see. And we haven't seen too much of it from Jack because obviously he just fucking knocks everyone out. But I imagine there will be grappling at some point in this match, in this fight. Obviously, both these guys, crazy power. Someone could get clipped quick. But I think if we see some grappling, you're gonna see how innovative Jack is and again to me the most exciting part of grappling is the scramble is the reversal is a chain of movements that take you from top from bottom to top and control that top position and I think that's something an area where the guy is really an innovator and honestly as crazy as this sounds given Gilbert's grappling background I'd love to see these guys have a submission grappling match that's something I'd love to see and yeah I've, personally having trained with Jack watch him train fucking the guy's incredible watching him and Volks work like Vox to me is probably the best cage wrestler in the world I'd say that's his strongest skill set most people know him as a striker and his uh, cage work goes unappreciated but wow watching these guys go out in the cage crazy I won't give too much away I got the sparring footage saved to my phone obviously for the right price that's available to anyone even their opponents because I'll sell my soul to get out of Wollongong but yeah, that's basically it. I mean, yeah, 
Wollongong. Obviously, it's a beautiful place. Like, we're sitting by fucking Lake Illawarra right now. But, like, man, you couldn't even commit suicide in this lake. Like, you see people out there fishing. They walk the whole thing and it's way steep. It's what kind of a sick joke. You want to end your suffering out here. The fucking lake's too shallow to do it. I saw some weird jellyfish thing in there earlier. I don't know what the fuck that is. Probably from pollution or something. But it creeped me out. But yeah, that's it in Wollongong. We leave on the 10th, we head to California. Final touches on the fight. And that's about it for the uh, Volks Council. I can really give away, but yeah, guy's in incredible shape. He's been working hard and more motivated than ever. Obviously, as you guys know, he's fucking obviously a fucking motivated guy, but coming off a loss, coming off a finish like that, this cunt is working hard. His, his fucking off-camp days are harder than any day I've ever had in my entire life. But yeah, that's about it for the Volkanovski camp. But in terms of other things, a couple of match announcements from me. So when I was with Volkanovski, I forget what UFC car we even were at. All I remember is it was the one where Drukas and fucking uh, Strickland got into a fist fight while I was sitting next to Strickland. That's all I remember about the event. That was such an exciting moment. I don't even remember the actual fights. Everyone had more fun with that. But during that time, the night before that, we went to the Karate Combat. Obviously, I hyped that up. It's like a fucking 80s movie. The amount of bizarre shit that was going on there. I loved it. Like a fucking, uh, I'd taken acid or something and ended up in an 80s movie. So when they reached out to me and they said, listen, Craig, we've got two words for you. Mexico City. I said, I'm in. So we got something planned. I won't say, obviously, there was more, more things on offer than just Mexico City. Obviously, Mexico's finest exports were on offer. Um, again, Wollongong exports youth unemployment. We know what Mexico exports, and we fucking love it. But yeah, I'll be down in Mexico City, February 23. I'll, it'll be against Phil Rowe. Phil Rowe, I consider him a friend of mine. A lot of people in the grappling community know him because he had an exhibition match against Gordon. It was, in, it was during one of Gordon's life-threatening illnesses that he had. You, so you start to lose count now. It was during one of his health retirements, when he came out of retirement, he had an exhibition match for Flo. Flo, he said, hey, give me Phil Rowe, give me these conditions. Flo said, hey, don't even lube it up. Go in dry, brother, because we are taking that deal. And it was a good match. I think he submitted him a few times, had some cool exchanges and shit. It's actually fun to watch. It's a fun way to do it. Um, I think Gordon probably ended up in hospital afterwards on dialysis with... Uh, health problems again he's I think he's retired now of everything except for ADCC I can't even keep up he's off defending the southern border or some shit like that very fucking confusing career choice I don't know what's going on with that he said he's doing ADCC uh, I think that's he's, who the fuck knows hey call his therapist we want to figure this shit out I don't even know how gone down this rabbit hole but yeah I'll be facing Phil Rowe Phil Rowe faced Nicky Rod Nicky Rod couldn't finish him that enticed me to do the match because I said, hey, if Nicky Rock couldn't finish him and I can finish him, that means when I finally return to B-Team, I can say, hey, kiss the ring, mate. The king of B-Team is back and he is a mid-30s cocaine and Xanax addicted professional athlete and he just submitted an opponent you didn't submit. So that's, obviously that's what I'm in it for and to see my Mexican people Mexican ground karate, the home of Mexican ground karate. I've never competed in Mexico. I'll take any excuse to go to Mexico. I go, I go as far as Tijuana, and obviously that's just for uh, my Anthony Bourdain level interest in the Chinese food down there, you know? I'll try anything, and you can get anything in Mexico. But yeah, karate combat, but we'll be in the pit. Karate combat's actually fucking really stirred my interest because the shape of the pit is sick. You... It's not fence wrestling. If if I shoot on you and your back hits the wall, you like there's a platform for me to drive you into and you can use the wall to stay up. But the pit, given its angle, if I shoot you can't sprawl. Your feet are gonna hit the base of the pit. Like maybe you jump your feet up the pit and do some fucking young Anthony Pettis shit, but how many people are gonna do that, you know? For me, I think if you shoot a double, there's no ability to sprawl, you can just run them into the pit wall so it changes things given how much it changes things and what an analytical brain I am do you think I've even tried training in the pit fuck no we'll just see what happens when we go out there 
Another interesting factor is a man with my world-renowned bad cardio. Mexico City is quite high. It's quite high altitude. I don't know how I'm going to handle that. All I know is when people go to Peru and they do Machu Picchu, they chew cocaine leaves. So maybe me doing cocaine before a match will help with the altitude sickness. I tell you what, there's only one way to find out, and that is to hit the bag the second I get off the plane. It's got to help because that altitude is going to kill me. We were just at three and a half thousand meters in Kazakhstan, and walking to take a piss took the breath out of me. I thought I was fucking going into cardiac arrest. So these are all interesting things that mean I could probably lose this match. But Karate Combat trialed out the grappling, the pit submission series, right? Sounds fucking sick. And Luke, South African warrior, Griffiths, went out there and he fought, grappled against Wagner Hosha. Now again, Luke, six foot five, fucking jacked, man, huge, huge fucking guy. Again, one of the best grapplers in the world. Uh, he went out there and he lost to Wagner. Wagner is 40 something years old, significantly smaller. Wagner's not six foot, Wagner's probably not 93 kilos. Like, for, I mean, Wagner, I think he fought at lightweight in the UFC. And he came out and he gassed Luke out. Like, Luke got to a, a front head submission, lost it, and then Wagner took him down twice. One of those exchanges, he took his back. The other exchange, he just finished on top, and he got the win over Luke, which is fucking crazy, and I feel like I didn't get enough attention. Like, I like obviously, New Wave can suck a bag of dicks, but those guys are good. Luke Griffiths is fucking good. That is a shocking upset and that's not me being like oh Wagner's bad Wagner was undersized and he's at the tail end of his career he's just thriving through the uh, hormone replacement industry of Florida um, but yeah that was an upset for the ages that's one of the biggest upsets I've seen in recent time that was a match that when it was booked everyone including myself said uh, why would you do that why would you do that Wagner you, you must not need the money or you must just fucking have some giant testicles but again if you're on TRT therapy like myself, we know you don't have giant testicles because me personally, after I come, my right one shoots back up inside my body. I have to push that thing out. So it's like, I don't know where I'm going with this, but it's the price you pay for greatness. But yeah, Wagner taking that out, very, very impressive. And if I was Wagner, I'd never take the rematch. You couldn't offer me enough money in the world to take that again. I ride off into the sunset, send him a message every now and then to remind him who's boss. But then Big Dan went out and faced Max Gimenez. And I don't know what happened. Supposedly Big Dan got injured, but I refuse to believe that. Big Dan lost. And there was a crazy photo of him afterwards covered in blood. So obviously bad night for New Wave, but it was a great night for Karate Combat. I know it Sims friends with the New Wave guys, so he gave, him a, uh, gave those guys those matches. But in terms of the promoter, two big upsets like that is great for the organization. The only thing I will say is what disgusted me was that None of the competitors decided to wear the gi pants and belt that a typical karate combat match has. That's part of the reason I'm doing this, to look like a fucking sick cunt in some fucking karate combat pants and belt. That's how me and Phil Rowe are going at it. Or maybe we have the fight for copyright because Phil Rowe wears the Bulls uniform, I wear the Bulls uniform. We both fight for the honor of being sued by the Chicago Bulls, which please, I hope never happens. Because it's a parody. I believe we're protected by parody law. Obviously, there's an inside joke there about what a bull is. If you don't know what a bull is, search on Urban Dictionary Cuck and then search on Urban Dictionary what a bull is. That's where we're going with the Austin Bulls. But yeah, that's it. That's for the Karate Combat. Me versus Phil Rowe. Phil Rowe, friend of mine. Again, going to be a good time. 10 minute match. 10 minute match in altitude. We should have done a 3 minute match, to be honest. But it's a bit of a warm-up match. Not a warm-up match because, yeah, I could lose this shit. For sure, I could lose to anyone. But a bit of a warm-up match because I haven't been active. Last match against Gerard Mearsham. And then Fight Pass twisted my arm with a Lovato match. Lovato's always been a name I've wanted to compete against. So I faced Lovato March 3rd in Vegas. That's another fact that twists my arm. If it snows in Mexico City, it's a blizzard in Vegas. You know what I mean? Allegedly might have even hit the slopes before a match one time against one of the best ever. But I thought it would clear my nasal congestion. It did not. Not recommended. 
But yeah, we um, have a match against Lovato, Rafael Lovato. I will say it's a match I've tried to book. Promoters have said, hey, who you want to face? I want to face Lovato. And that's not because I see a strategic weakness in Lovato. If anything, it's because I check his age and he's a little older. And I, you might see that as vulnerability, but my counter argument would be, I think we're both probably have the same age heart given the damage and mileage mine has on it. My lifestyle is a great equalizer. It's the reason we look the same age, me and Lovato, but he's 40 and I am 32, I think. But yeah, this is a match, again, I've always wanted, we've never been able to get it done. Flo, I tried to get Flo to book it, they couldn't make it happen. Fire Pass, we've tried in the past, we couldn't make it happen. But Steven Tetchy got it done, he booked it. And we got the main event for this one. Uh, Lovato, again, the reason I want this match is because there's key names that are pivotal when you're coming up. Sometimes if you ask a grappler who influenced you the most, it's gonna be based on who was famous and who was doing well at a lower belt for these guys, right? So like if you're a, who was a big name competitor when you were a purple belt? And when I was a purple belt, guys like Lovato were, they were the big names of my generation. So for me, when I'm a purple belt, when I was a purple belt aspiring professional competitor, those are the names that I was like, holy fuck, it'd be sick to have a match against these guys, sick to beat these guys. And now as I get older in the grappling world, these guys are retiring, so it's not too many opportunities for me to face these gentlemen. But yeah, shout out to UFC Fire Pass for getting that booked. Um, obviously, I'm not coming in with a crazy camp or anything like this. Like, I'm helping uh, Volks. I've been traveling around, putting my body through hell, jet lag hell. But that's not to say I've not been studying tape, technique, coming up with game plans, trying my best to get in shape. Unfortunately, got staff right now, but we'll be back training soon and hopefully uh, get a couple of good results. Like obviously when I pick opponents, I see a path to victory. If I don't see a path to victory, I don't take the match. Or if I do take the match, we put that money up and we try to change the rules as best we can. I criticize Gordon, I'll be like, oh, you pick your opponents, you pick your rules. Well, guess what, my friends? It's called leverage. I hope I can do the same thing if I can. I just have less leverage, but yeah. This will be a fun one. Honestly, be a fun one. It's a tough one. Lovato have a bit of weight on me, a bit of size. He's better looking than me. Allegedly, his dick's bigger, but that remains to be seen. We'll see that in the showers after the match, in the victory lap. But yeah, March 3rd, Las Vegas, and then February 23, Mexico City. I want to be in Mexico City for two, three nights. I'll probably hang around. I want to watch the uh, what's Brian Ortega, Yair Rodriguez rematch. Super curious to see how that goes. Well, Tega, that beautiful bastard, he fights once every fucking solar eclipse, but how can you blame him with the amount of pussy he must be fighting off on a daily basis? That's part of the reason I think he's such a good grappler. It's just he's always thrown down with some fucking women out there. So that'll be a great card to see. I don't know who's on the March 3rd. There's a March 3rd or 4th UFC or maybe March 2nd. I think it was originally meant to be in Saudi Arabia, but it got moved to the uh, to the Apex. And we got Nicky Rod. Uh, Roberto Jimenez in the co-main. Roberto, one of the most exciting grapplers in the world. I believe he has a victory over Nicky Rod, just based on the particular rule set they were doing. But that's going to be a scrap. Roberto Jimenez has a level of mental illness where he just throws caution to the wind and goes for the kill. I remember I competed against him at Flow Grappling, got the W early in his career. He's kind of vulnerable to heel hooks, so I got the W and I said, hey, let's never do that again. No, thank you. It's the same with the Ty Rotolo match. I believe Ty just turned 18. I was waiting the motherfucker out. I was like, nah, 17. Not only is that illegal, that's frowned upon and people won't celebrate the victory. So I waited him out until he turned 18. I exploited his youth, something I've never done to anyone before. And so that's not common in the jiu-jitsu community at all. I got the victory over Ty Rotolo, And I said, guess what? We ain't doing that again. I want to pick strategic names to beat at vulnerable stages of their career and then never face them again. Unfortunately, every now and then there's a motherfucker like Miki Galvao where I'm like, fuck, I could have met this kid at 14, probably lost, would have really hurt my career. But yeah, there's, there's certain times where you have great opportunities to beat names there. It's like an investment, you know, I can say, hey, fuck, I recognize the skill of this guy. Let me beat him at a time in his career where he doesn't have adult strength. And that's basically the marketing strategy for how I built my career. First it was heel hooks, then it was victimizing people I thought I had an edge over. 
But yeah, who knows what the future holds for me, you know? Every time I compete now, I think of it like it could be my last match because i got so much other shit going on. So much other shit, to be, quite frankly, I prefer to do with my life. We're doing a lot of media stuff. Sort of, uh, we're doing some documentary stuff I can't really talk about. Obviously, in an effort to grow the sport and also in a selfish effort to uh, grow my own name and my pockets. But definitely coming to an end here. So every match, I'm not going to announce retirement. I might pretend to because it gets you paid more next time. But yeah, I don't know how many matches I got left. Honestly, ADCC, I'm 50-50 on ADCC. You know what I mean? It's the fucking pinnacle of the sport. It's the Olympics. It'd be great to win. But do I do it? I don't know if I do. I don't know if my body or my heart can handle another serious three-month training camp like that. But it remains to be seen. But I better make a decision soon because I think we'll be getting the call. We'll be getting that message. We'll get that invitation that says, hey, motherfucker, what weight division are you doing? So I gotta, I gotta have a good think about it. But yeah, again, I might not do ADCC, and the Lovato match could be my last match ever. You know, like if I beat Lovato, we're gonna hit up Nicholas Marigali. I'm gonna say, listen here. Maybe we do it again. Maybe we don't. But if we do it again, give me, give me all the money. Give me everything you have. Give me enough money that if I lose, I don't even care. You know. But yeah, different stage in my career now. Some of these guys are training full time twice a day me twice a week on a good week mostly traveling mostly partying mostly i mean coaching mma guys creating fucking pointless media on a park bench but yeah that's where my career is right now we'll, we'll really see it's got to be an interesting opponent it's got to be a very interesting amount of money and i'll do it but yeah in terms of uh in terms of what else has been going on we just got back from kazakhstan now, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, hey, Craig, you're going to come on here and you're going to make some cheap fucking Borat jokes about Kazakhstan. They're going to be bad. They're going to be a low level, punching down level of comedy. And I'm going to say to you, I'm not that type of person because, quite frankly, I'm a coward. And if I made any Borat jokes, those people might physically harm me. But Borat is a funny movie. And the reason it's funny is because if you go to Kazakhstan... Kazakhstan is one of the most beautiful places I've ever been. First of all, it has mountains. I'm from Australia. Australia is very flat. Australia is as flat as a single girl. There's nothing big here at all. Mount Kosciuszko is 2,000 something meters. The lodge we're at over there was 3,500 meters high. That was not good for my health. I couldn't even, yeah, like I said earlier, walk around without running out of breath I was starting to get quite concerned about that Mexico City match when I was at that level of altitude but really what I think gets lost in translation sometimes is the victims of Borat the true victims are the Americans that just believed that Sasha Baron Cohen could say he was from Kazakhstan put on an accent not relevant to Kazakhstan have mannerisms and things like that that have nothing to do with Kazakhstan and because a lot of Americans don't see the world outside their country, they just believed fucking all of it. And it's funny, as a foreigner that lives in America, I've had Americans come up to me and say, Australia, what fucking language do you speak down there? And we could really say absolutely anything. So I think as a non-American watching Borat, you really appreciate the level of joke that he's playing on the people he speaks to in the movie. The crazy thing is, is even the start of the movie is filmed in fucking Romania. It's not even in Kazakhstan. They're not even Kazakh people in it. So although it's obviously was a sore spot in the country and pissed off a lot of Kazakhs, the true joke lies in the people, in the, the Americans. Obviously, it could work in a lot of countries. It just works really well in America because, yeah, America is like the, the center of the world for a lot of cultural things, and a lot of Americans only focus on American culture. So, yeah. They do fall victim to those jokes very, very well. So I would say, uh, as much as I love Kazakhstan, that movie's fucking funny, I just wish a lot of people would realize who the joke was on. You know what I mean? But yeah, Kazakhstan, beautiful place. We're at this, my friend Alan's Mountain Lodge. I've been going to Kazakhstan since 2016. I went there in 2016 for ADCC trials. Made great friends 
with a lot of people over there. Alan, Tooligan, um, a lot of the local guys. Yerzan, I can't even fucking pronounce his name right because I'm Austra retarded Australian accent. Yeah, I love Kazakhstan. We've gone there a long time. Beautiful, beautiful place. Great people. Uh, in terms of their culture, right, obviously they're nomadic tribesmen. That's their origins and stuff. So in that sense, I believe traditionally they didn't see a lot of people they would live in isolation so one thing they do really good is host a person so if you're formally invited and they host you god damn it they treat you like a fucking king over there and i think again that dates back to the traditional culture where because they wouldn't see many people the people they would see they would welcome him in they would take care of him they would feed him give him everything so yeah in terms of uh, me that's still one of my favorite places i've ever been some of my favorite people I've ever dealt with are all from Kazakhstan, so it's definitely a top tier place for you guys to go. I would highly recommend a trip to Kazakhstan. I don't want to say too much because we're actually gonna we've got a bit of a project going on over there, but I won't spill the beans on that. So yeah, some more interesting stuff about Kazakhstan, right? Is uh, I was over there and it was fucking minus twenty degrees, fucking freezing. We went there on a whim from Bali. We had some business there. Again, I can't really explain too much of this shit right now, but you guys will see it in the future. Hopefully in the near future, this shit could take a while. But yeah, we were in Bali. I didn't even expect to go to Kazakhstan, so we had no winter clothes at all. So I just had my fucking Bogan Bali kit. So we had to land in Kazakhstan, immediately head to the mall and find the most ridiculous snow-covered outfits we could find. But yeah, in terms of... Uh, the place, yeah, we got taken care of very, very well. We trained a Kazakhstan top team. I've trained there many, many times over the years. Super tough grapplers. One of my old friends from New York, Alibi's there. Dude's a beast. It was very tough rounds each and every day. Even Almaty as a city, the city we were in, uh, seemed like high altitude, or maybe it was a jet lag, but it was fucking hard training. I had about three rounds of me every day before I quit. Almaty is a city, sick, sick food. We ate horse every day. The guys told me horses cure everything. Fucking injuries, male pattern baldness. As soon as they said that, I was like, brother, we are eating bishbamak, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Forget the trip to Turkey. Get some horse into you. So we pounded that down. Um, the architecture around there is wild. It's like uh, all this Soviet architecture that's sick. I believe the other city, Astana, up north is more of like a Dubai like looking city that looks nothing like their Soviet roots but yeah I love all the old, old Soviet architecture it looks looks fucking wild one weird thing about these snow places maybe someone can explain this to me is that um, the buildings the heat is set so fucking high so it's like I go outside I got a hoodie and a jacket on and I'm okay I walk into a restaurant walk into my hotel room and it's 45 degrees fucking celsius in there i'm cooking alive and i'm like that fucking change in temperature i just don't get it eh? same shit would happen to me in new york like i lost so much time of the day just dressing and undressing it's like hey just set the heat down a little like uh, the hotel we're at we had to open the fucking window so if it's minus 20 outside and we have to open the windows to be able to sleep at night how about you fucking crank it down a bit? That just lets me know that a woman is in charge of the heating system there because it's hotter than hell. It is fucking hotter than hell in some of those buildings. And something that made sense to me, so when I first walked into the room, I look at my bar fridge, and in my bar fridge, there's obviously the regular things you'd expect, like soft drink, water, but the condoms, there were condoms in the room, and they were in the bar fridge. And in some sort of sick joke, the bar fridge was locked. You had to call the staff to open it. But at first I thought, why the fuck are the condoms in the fridge? And then I realized, wow, the room is like a sauna. If you're getting lucky that night, you might be actually enticed to use a condom to cool yourself down. Not cool your, just cool yourself down, but cool down that lucky Kazakh lady that you're indulging there. Those are some of the interesting things, eh? Like fucking condoms in the fridge. In all the places in the world I've been, I've never seen condoms in the fridge, nor thought it would ever have a purpose unless you were running that heating system so fucking high. But I don't know, maybe I feel the hot more because I'm on so many drugs, I'm on so many fucking uh, stimulants every day, 
oral steroids, my T levels are high. God bless Ever Titan. Um, maybe that's why I feel the heat more. But fuck me, I can't handle it. I can't sleep in the heat. I want it to be nice and cold. Some other interesting observations, just generally, about people from that part of the world, right? Is obviously Russia and Kazakhstan, different places, but some sometimes culturally they have some similar things. I would say those Russian women or Kazakh women, they treat servers at restaurants worse than fucking Hitler treat the Jews treated the Jews. Some of the most wild shit I've ever seen. Entertaining as fuck. They say what you're thinking, but again, terrifies me. They have no fear at all at what the waiting staff are gonna do to their meal in the back room there, you know? I've seen them yell at staff over fucking Coca-Cola not being delivered or opened on time. Many things, many things, such as we saw one individual, and this kills me, this kills me, get into an argument with the uh, server at a airport restaurant because there weren't enough cucumbers in the salad. And I'm sitting here thinking, it's a fucking airport restaurant. Like, relax on the Michelin star service that you're expecting here. There's four cucumbers in that salad. That's more than enough cucumbers in a country that's too cold to grow them. You know what I mean? Have some appreciation that there are cucumbers in that salad. Other stuff like that, some other wild shit we heard. When we are in Bali, we heard a girl ask another girl, ask a uh, Russian or a Kazakh, I forget. They asked them what they uh, do for work. What the fuck is that noise? This guy's stealing something. That's the hardest working man in Wollongong. Where's he going with that? I don't even know what the fuck I just witnessed. We, asked, so we, asked, we were sitting in a restaurant, we heard a girl ask a Russian or a Kazakh, she said, what do you do for work? She says, are you crazy? I have a boyfriend. Why would I work? So it's like, it's crazy being in these parts of the world, hearing the different uh, different cultural things you observe, but the shit's hilarious, eh? Like that answer to that question, fucking priceless. But yeah, just some minor observations and stuff. I'm trying to think of what other, what other funny shit. I mean, the whole purpose of the trip, we had an ulterior motive. Um, we had to do some business there, but truthfully we went because we wanted to hit the mountain lodge and one of our friends I won't name his name but he was in trouble with his wife he couldn't come with us on this trip and he has a long history supposedly of fucking being a mountain man in Montana but as far as I know I believe he rode a horse one time on a fucking paid for tourist trip in Montana and suddenly thinks he's Heath Ledger so obviously given he wasn't allowed on this trip that deeply motivated the rest of the friendship group to go to give him FOMO about missing out on these things. And the lodge we went to is incredible. It's a thousand square kilometers. It's up in the mountains. There's snow leopards, wolves, rams, deers, fucking a bunch of crazy shit up there. I've been up there before. Last time we were up there, we were riding the snow buggies and the guy that showed me around Alan scared the fuck out of me. Adrenaline junkie. Again, I don't know how you'd be an adrenaline junkie in that country, given just uh, how the women behave over there would put the fear in you. Very, very serious, very serious individuals, very scary, very at murderous rage you'll see in public quite often. Um, but yeah, I was in the snowmobile buggy. I still haven't recovered from that experience. We're driving like 100 k's an hour, fucking doing doughies and shit like that. And then this time we were on the snow snowmobiles. I've never driven a snowmobile, but I knew there was cause for concern when he put a back brace on me and then said, be careful. So I got on the snowmobile, we cranked those things 70, 80 k's an hour. I think our friend Mitch took it close to 100. That man truly wanted to die at that time. But yeah, we went on this long adventure. We're tracking wolves and shit. Uh, we didn't see any wolves. Last time I was on the snow buggies, so we were, we're out, it's fucking again, minus 16 degrees. We're basically at the furthest point of his property, which was like deep. We went deep and he decided he'd let me drive and I immediately broke the fan belt of the snow buggy. And then the other guy, the American guy, Steve, that was with us, broke the fan belt of his buggy at precisely the same time. So we turned the corner and we go to come back and his fucking snow buggies crashed too. So we're stuck out there. We get on the sat phone, 
not working. We're getting the walkie-talkie. Not work, working. I think we were 20 kilometers back from base. So we just had to start walking. When we were walking, we started hearing wolves howl on either side of us. And I'm thinking, this ain't right. This doesn't sound good. But we walked. We probably walked an hour, hour and a half. And then ended up radioing back to base. They came and picked us up. Crisis averted. And then we went back and we had a sauna. And they cooked me alive. They would hit me with branches and shit. But we, we, we recovered from that cold spell. But yeah, being out in the mountains and in the cold is fucking scary. Alain showed me a video of these guys out in the snow. Buggies having a great time, having a laugh or whatever. And then um, one of them got stuck. And then they all got stuck out there and they didn't have enough warm clothes. And it's like, it looked like fucking a horror movie. It was like a the stages of the TikTok video of these boys on an adventure and then slowly uh, one of them froze to death before they got rescued the next day. It was fucking wild. And there I am out in the snowmobile, no experience whatsoever. But we got through it, we persevered, we're out there a few hours. Yeah, and then, yeah, experiences you really, not many people have. But yeah, this is why I love Kazakhstan. These fucking people take care of us so good. Legends, I'll keep going back. What other shit did we do on this trip? Prior to Kazakhstan, I was, yeah, back in Bali, back in Indonesia. Before that, we were in the Philippines. We were in the Philippines for business, allegedly. But the Philippines is where we filmed the uh, Ladyboy Wake Up Call, the Ladyboy Gender Reveal. Fuck, that was a good time. I love hanging out with Ladyboys. They're one of the boys, truly one of the boys. They have a laugh. Like, today when I walked into JB Hi-Fi, to buy, it was a local electronics place, I had to buy a microphone, and first and foremost, JB Hi-Fi, like, they look like they go straight to the unemployment line at Centrelink and just pick people out of a hat to hire there. That's the general appearance of these people. Very strange looking people, tattoos, everything, but the second I walk through, we see a aggressive, tr uh, like, obviously trans woman, and, but very taken aback, very serious character, as opposed to the lady boys you deal with in Thailand they're really just are fucking having a laugh at your expense doing their best to make you uncomfortable given they know that you may be not into lady boys they try to twist your arm on that and then obviously after a few drinks they do often succeed but it's funny the contrast between the personas of the lady boys in Thailand the trans people in Thailand versus uh, the ones in the west you know something uh, something crazy to see but yeah they're fun they're a fucking good time Lady Point Podcast got serious. I didn't know where to take it. I tried to uphold some journalistic integrity and not make too many jokes. Some of the jokes didn't translate too well. Went over her head. The other ones, she she opened up a bit at the end, you know. She was talking about her midget fetishes and shit. But yeah, I don't know where I'm going with this. But yeah, I spent a lot of time with lady boys lately. Maybe that's why this staph infection isn't healing. Picked up... Uh, some immunocompromising diseases in Southeast Asia, but I wouldn't be the first Australian man to do so. But yeah, we're out in the Philippines, having fun making those videos. You, some people might say we exploited these people because we paid them to be in the videos, but fuck me. These girls had a good time. They had a good fucking laugh. They understand exactly where we're coming from with that type of humor, and they get behind it. Obviously, they're having a laugh at our expense, a little bit at their expense, you know. We did the gender reveal balloon pop. That was a good time. We also did the wake up call and the wake up call video was fucking awesome. I felt like the Pied Piper walking to the streets of the Philippines. We started with 10 girls and three lady boys. As we walked through the streets, they fucking came out of nowhere. They started piling on. We had an army of these lovely women. The hotel we went to were awesome. They said, hey, uh, obviously your buddy's up in this room, but because he didn't pay for the room, the room wasn't under his name. so." bang we got that key straight away this individual didn't lock the door you think they'd lock the door if you're going on a trip with me and you're going to bed early deadbolt the door for your own protection because you'll fucking need it didn't deadbolt the door but the guy i was with i won't say his name but he's a fucking legend said hey if they fucking lock that door we will kick it down we'll get the girl we'll get the lady boy with eyebrows to kick that shit down because she looks like she has a stomper of a kick luckily he didn't deadbolt it this gentleman had uh, taken some benzos to adjust to the jet lag. So when these ladyboys woke him up, he didn't even know where he was. No idea where he was. And we had, but I mean, we started with 13. I think there were over 20 in there. And the guy that hosted us actually gave us um, a welcome pack, a bunch of, a bunch of random items. 
in this welcome pack, uh, an assortment of items. But I tell you what, when I walked into my hotel room, it took me 15 minutes and a fucking knife to get into this welcome pack to have a look what was in there. The lady boys in this room opened that thing like nothing. They got into that in front of my very eyes. Like they stole washing detergent, they stole fucking dishwashing detergent, spam, everything. Everything that could be taken was taken. So they ransacked the house. They even um, immediately found my friend's Valium, crushed it up, and snorted it. It was it was a wild experience. We were we were hoodwinked. This was like fucking the Ocean's Eleven of Lady Boys. And I tell you what, they're a fucking dangerous crew. They got all of our things, but luckily the the hotel staff blocked them at the entrance. We got our Valium back and we got our spam back. Obviously, we paid them to be there, so I mean, like fucking relax, taking the spam, you know the spam was needed and that was that experience we made that video that video went pretty well little Duval shared it calling me a passport bro but like saying we yeah this was wild as well right so like little Duval is a uh, a black rapper and he's made the joke that oh look white boys take these things too far you can't trust them and some of the comments I read on his post were wild like uh one woman was complaining one black lady was complaining that um White men have too much freedom to make gay jokes and get away with it, and black men don't have the same privileges. And I was like, what the fuck are you even complaining about? You're complaining that, like, this is cancel, this is like, people talk about cancel culture all the time. I don't think cancel culture exists. I think if you get canceled, you either did something horrible or you ain't that fucking funny to begin with. You know what I mean? Like, if it's funny, it's funny. But that ladyboy prank, wake up cool. I think pretty funny and this black chick's on there complaining and her post got a ton of views like there were a bunch of black dudes on this post being like white guys get all the fun they're gonna make all the gay jokes and no one judges them but in black culture african-american culture they can't do that shit at all and it's like i don't i don't understand that because i'm in a sport of jiu-jitsu that's very homophobic and i go fucking aggressively into the fire you know you just have to be willing that people think you're actually gay and a lot of people think I'm actually gay and I think just because of the few experiences I had with lady boys don't define me as a man but yeah little Duval's Instagram comments were hilarious um, those comments blew my mind like people complain about anything they'll be like uh, how like white privilege of making gay jokes you know what I mean I'd never thought I'd hear that in my entire life but shout out to little Duval for blowing that post up and recirculating it. I think it's some of the best work I've done. And again, lady boys are so fun. They're fucking down for anything. They're down for anything. I remember the first, we made some massage parlor videos in uh, the southern end of Phuket. And my brother was with me and one lady boy loved him. My brother's six foot eight. So, and one of the lady boys, and I would say of the pack we had, she was the most attractive. You leave me with this one for a long enough time, maybe half a shot of tequila. I'm in. If there's food in the fridge, you eat it, you know what I mean? But this one sensed my brother's discomfort and just pushed the line with him consistently, was being like, oh, this guy, I'll take him in, he's free, I'll service this man for free. And my brother was fucking terrified. And I love that shit. I love that they sense you're uncomfortable and that's like blood in the water to them. That's uh, something I, I can get behind and that's why I love having a good time with them because they will fucking roast you like you roast them. But I think that's it. Where else we went? Yeah, again, just keep going back to Bali, getting on benders, risking becoming a Bali 10 member, going to Bali MMA training. I'm really out there with my two friends, Andrew Leone and Mitch Burgess, Mitty Burgess. I'm out there with these two guys, and I'm really in an effort to ruin their relationships because we, we have this running joke that, like, if you're married and you travel with me, you very highly run the risk of divorce it becomes what we call divorce survivor like when uh your wife calls hey andrew you're out of the house fucking extinguish the torch we we're gonna make a video on that but uh it hit too close to home so we we left it alone mitch truly has the last laugh because if he's uh, if his wife kicks him out they're not married it's just a girlfriend you know for a long relationship mind you but yeah that's the joke because you travel with me you're gonna end up getting divorced and that's actually a good question, probably to finish this podcast on. 
<clears throat> if I woke you up with 15 ladyboys, would your wife leave you or would she laugh? Because generally everyone thinks it's hilarious. Most of these things are fucking hilarious. Most people I spoke to about this were like, yo, my wife thought that was hilarious, but she said, yo, if that was you, I would fucking kill you. And if they're from Eastern Europe, they fucking mean that too. They really mean that. You see a Eastern European woman with an older man at duty free in the airport, they're fucking gaining reparations for World War II. They take that shit to heart. So yeah, you, you let me be the judge if you think I've taken things too far with this. But I think Divorce Survival would be an incredible show for men traveling the world for business. Each week they have challenges. Putting your phone on do not disturb for six hours. Not replying to messages, not answering calls. Last marriage standing doesn't win anything. They just don't lose half their stuff. I think it's great. I think that could be picked up. And that's it for a solo fucking rant. I barely even took a breath. I think I hit the cutoff point of 50 minutes. Shout out to my main sponsors, Evertitan. Honestly, without Evertitan, I think I'd probably be dead. Evertitan have made a firm call to action. These guys pay me decent money and they said, hey, Craig, please, enough with the dick jokes. We offer many more services other than dick jokes. And that's true. That's true, they do do that, right? So like, guys, the reason I'm alive is the 200 milligrams of testosterone cypionate I take per week. Right now, I think I'm taking 200 or 100 deca a week too. Um, although my prescription just ran out in Australia, so it's hard to get that shit shipped here. We got 50 milligrams of Anavar a day too. That's why we've been looking like a mountain man lately. Uh, that's really all I've got to say. That's all I'm on, you know? Obviously, they, they offer other things like fucking peptides. But, you know, peptides, some of this shit you have to inject every day. Uh, it's fucking hard enough to brush my teeth every day. Like, for me to do peptides every day, give me, the, give me something I take once, twice a week, you know? Test is easy. Test feels fucking great. Every fitness influencer on earth that's trying to sell you shit like weird supplements and stuff, Tongat Ali, fuck that off. And get on some testosterone you'll never feel better you again your dick will never work better um but that's it yeah b tash team save five percent on ever titan you've seen what it's done to freddie freddie's gone from a child into a teenager into a latin american teenager uh he's gained a little bit of power a little bit of self-confidence um his wife jesse jess would still be the shit out of him but it's the thought that counts it's the uh it's the uh, strength he's gained mentally and physically. And that's, a, that's fucking it. Other sponsors. We lost Mood. Mood dropped us. I think I was too lazy on the commercials. Sanibel. Guys, Sanibel makes some sick MMA gear. They somehow did it right. They got a licensing deal with NASA. That's fucking sick. That's fucking sick. That might offend Eddie Bravo, but yeah. Sanibel. Shout out to Sanibel. Be the bull. Buy some Sanibel. And I think that's all I've got to offer you right now. Guys, El Segundo podcast solo episode. Tell me if this was just obnoxious because we couldn't find a host. Couldn't find someone willing to risk their career. I actually asked Lovato. I said, Lovato, let's fucking do this match. Let's do a podcast. He's like, listen, Craig, I'll do the match. But your podcast is too controversial for me. And I said, that's okay. You be transphobic. I'm supporting ladyboys out here. Supporting small industry. Su supporting female entrepreneurs. God damn it, that's what we do on this podcast.